Let us resume our discussion of modernity in Jewish history by looking at the Sephardic diaspora. You'll recall that uh, just three lectures ago we spent a little bit of time talking about what is modernity, uh, what does that term actually mean in terms of Jewish history, and why is 1492 often taken as kind of like the turning point from the medieval period to the modern period, obviously connected to the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and subsequently their uh, departure from Portugal as well, a little more complicated departure. Um, what I really would like to emphasize today is not so much the elements of modernity that advanced with the Sephardic diaspora, but just to get a little bit of a better sense of where did the Sephardim go and uh, just a hint of how they were such a disruptive element and pushed Jewish history into an entirely new direction, uh, the modern period, uh, as we discussed a couple of lectures ago. So first of all, let's start with who exactly are we talking about? Who are the Sephardim? The term Sephardi is an adjective. Sephardim is the plural, uh, which means basically people from Sephardad. This is generally understood to mean Spain. Uh, it really includes Portugal as well. It's really the entire Iberian Peninsula, although there is often a distinction made between Spanish exiles and Portuguese exiles. The Spanish exiles were typically not forced to convert to Christianity before departing the Iberian Peninsula, and as a result, they left the region as Jews and had to deal with the disabilities that continued to be placed upon them wherever their destinations were. Uh, Portuguese Jews, on the other hand, were subject to a mass forced conversion in 1497, and so as a result, they occupied a very unusual space in Jewish and European history because here were people who consider themselves to be at heart and in their core identities clearly Jewish. Obviously there was a spectrum, there were some who embraced Christianity, but they really drop out of the story of Jewish history for the most part. They still consider themselves Jewish for generations and often hid their identity from their neighbors and sometimes even from their own children until they reached adulthood. Uh, but they had all of the freedoms associated with Christian identity, which meant that they could travel, they could um, enter universities, they could enter professions, even enter the church. It's a fascinating and unusual history. So Portuguese Jews in their diaspora are often quite different from Spanish Jews, and they have a marked impact, perhaps even more than the Spanish Jews, uh, for reasons that we will discuss. Furthermore, there are many Jews who are not of Spanish or Portuguese descent who nevertheless identify themselves as Sephardi or Sephardi. Uh, for example, one of the greatest of the Sephardi thinkers of the 20th century is this man, Harab Ovadi Yosef, who was the uh, chief Sephardi rabbi of Israel and a, really a brilliant thinker, very prolific, and he was from Baghdad. Uh, the Baghdadi Jews go back centuries upon centuries, all the way back to the Talmudic era and possibly beyond, uh, without having anything to do with Spain directly. Nevertheless, it is their intellectual identification and religious identification with Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, who was perhaps the most famous of the Sephardi exiles, that brings them within the larger campus Faradim. To be sure, more sophisticated discussions of ethnicity and ethnic identities would require a distinction between Sephardi and Mizrahi Jewry, or Eidut and Mizrach, the Eastern communities, but many Jews who kind of attach themselves to that Sephardi intellectual religious tradition call themselves Sephardim, even though ethnically they're really more Middle Eastern than um, you know, uh, Spanish. Another interesting kind of example where you might see this is, for example, there are um, there are significant populations of non-Eastern European Chabad Jews. So they identify as Chabad, which is a very kind of Ashkenazic movement, but they are not Ashkenazim. So it's possible by by way of uh, accumulating identities that they can overlap, um, even though they don't necessarily make sense on a basis of nomenclature. At any rate. The Sephardim that we're talking about today are primarily those um, who were sent into a diaspora, but they would have a much larger impact on their ind the indigenous populations that they encountered, as for example in Baghdad. 
Here's one of my favorite maps of the uh, Sephardic diaspora that uh, gives you a sense of the scope of it. And we're, it's hard to get a really good sense of how many Jews actually fled Spain, uh, first with the expulsion in 1492 and then with the um, more gradual process that took place over a century in, from Portugal in particular. But it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume it's about a quarter of a million Jews. And as you can see, significant numbers of them went to the most you know, proximate locations in North Africa or Portugal itself or across the uh, Pyrenees into southern France. But uh, the really wide diaspora takes us into several areas that we're going to look at in this video. Uh, three in particular, again very briefly, but just to get a sense of how diverse the impact is, we'll look at the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, specifically, we'll look at their impact on the land of Israel uh, and in Constantinople, also known as Istanbul, uh, and in fact that's what it would be called at this point, um, although uh, the name Constantinople does persist in many contexts up until the 20th century. Uh, this is a very important Jewish center. It goes back all the way to the ancient period, uh, but it becomes especially important because it was one of the major destinations of Jews at this time. Uh, also, Greece was within this kind of cultural orbit because all of them fall within the larger Ottoman Empire. Uh, then we're going to look briefly at Europe, and I'll focus on Italy in particular, although the because that was one of the major destinations of Jews. Although we certainly have a lot more to say about Amsterdam, uh, we won't talk about it today because I, I saved that for a couple other lectures. Uh, and then finally, uh, just a very quick look at the Americas. What happened when Jews crossed the Atlantic Sea? either as Jews per se or more frequently as conversos, uh, those Portuguese Jews who hope to reestablish some kind of Jewish presence in the New World free from the Inquisition. Okay, those are the three areas we're going to look at very quickly. Let us begin with Israel, which is the site of an absolutely fantastic and amazing spiritual renaissance that occurs in particular in the northern town of Tzfat. Now I'm going to devote, I plan to devote a video specifically to Tzfat because it is so amazing. And I myself have spent a lot of time studying it. I actually wrote a book on one of the uh, thinkers who lived in Tzfat at this time, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. Here you see uh, uh, one view of the uh, famous graveyard of the great Kabbalists who found themselves in Tzfat at the, uh, at the, in the uh, decades after the um, Spanish expulsion, and they have this custom of painting their graves blue, which um, is understood to be a color that wards off the evil eye. You can also see in the background there the beautiful vistas of Tzfat. It is located at a very high elevation, and you get this commanding view all over the Galil. Now what happened in Tzfat was, it's rather unusual, it was really something of a nothing town in northern Israel. Jerusalem was clearly the major center of Jewish activity, but for uh, primarily tax purposes, the Ottoman Empire uh, released some tax uh, disabilities on new settlement in northern part of the Galilee. And uh, Jews who were very active in the uh, textile trade in particular began to settle this region quite rapidly. Early on, many of those settlers were uh, exilees from Spain and later Portugal. And in the, the, over the course of the 16th century, really not even the entire century, really about 70 years, this one town attracted a brilliant number of really important mystical thinkers, including uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo, who we mentioned earlier. He is the author of the Code of Jewish Law, and much of what he wrote was actually written in, with the Spanish exiles in uh, Greece and in Constantinople, but he ended his career in Svat. Um, the great Moshe Alshech, a fantastic commentator, very Kabbalistic kind of in inclinations. Uh, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the figure who occupied so much of my own energies, the author of Pardes Ramonim, Tomer and Devorah, other great classics, and his very brief student, because they only spent less than a year together, uh, the great Arizal, who was not Sephardic in origin, he actually came from Egypt, um, they were all concentrated in Sfat 
in this very short period of time, creating an incredible explosion of Jewish creativity uh, in a literary realm that, that also coincided with the availability of much cheaper printing with the invention of the printing press that suddenly made Sfat just kind of like this, this you know, flash on the horizon of, of great creativity that still continues to reverberate throughout the centuries. Um, th it ended with some disasters. There were plagues that afflicted the region. There was earthquakes that afflicted Sfat, and it went into a significant decline uh, at the end of the 1500s, but nevertheless, really important transformative moment in Jewish intellectual history as a result largely of the Spanish exiles coming here. And I think one of the things that drove their thinking and made it such a powerful moment is that they really had this tremendously apocalyptic vision of what the exile from Spain meant, that it was you know, nigh on the Messianic era, and that how Jews reacted to it would be crucial and so on. If you look, I mentioned Chabad earlier. Chabad is also very useful in this context because they follow the Lurianic system of Kabbalah, which also has this very strong, you know, uh, inherence in human behavior and its relationship to the impact on the cosmos as a whole. Very, very dramatic, very motivational, very inspirational, and so on. Much of this really stems from that huge burst of energy that comes out its spot. We also see in Constantinople, here's a postcard that depicts the, the glorious interior of the Hagia Sophia, first built as a church, then later converted to a mosque by the Muslim invaders. Um, There's a postcard from the 19th century, I believe. And um, in Constantinople, there was a tremendous number of Jews settling there, primarily because it was the capital of the Ottoman Empire, the great administrative center. And the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire uh, laughed at Spaniards openly, saying, why are you expelling the Jews? They are incredibly useful. They are literate, numerate, they are well-connected internationally because of their earlier diaspora, and he invited the Jews to the Ottoman Empire, to places like Tzvat, to the capital city of Constantinople. So there is a huge surge of Jewish uh, activity in Constantinople as a lot of the, the Jewish exiles make their way there. Uh, you also see Jews in some of the most important centers, uh, such as, for example, uh, Greece and the Balkans. It, here's a, a fascinating picture from 1846, very early, from Thessaloniki, Salonika, one of the most important Jewish centers of Greece, and it, it represents three women in traditional costume. On the left, a Muslim woman, in the center, a Jewish woman, who is wearing absolutely amazing shaitel, and uh, a Bulgarian woman who I imagine is Christian, although it's unusual to see a Christian woman veiled like that. I don't know enough about the history of costumes, but I thought it was a really fascinating photograph. So the Jews of Thessalonically really get a huge boost from the Spanish exiles as well. So that's kind of like looking at some of the impact on the Ottoman Empire, where they brought a modernizing, westernizing, but at the same time deeply mystical approach to Judaism and the outside world. Looking at Europe, uh, Italy was one of the most important destinations of the Sephardic exiles, uh, and they were extremely creative there, reflecting backwards on their past. On the right here, you see um, a gorgeous translation of the Bible into Spanish, Hebrew Bible into Spanish, uh, by these Portuguese exiles. It's called the Ferrara Bible, named after Ferrara, a city in Italy, where there were um, significant settlements of these exiles, uh, many of them who brought significant wealth with them, and they supported scholarship, in particular two women who we'll discuss in just a second. On the left, you see a Portuguese document, The Consolations for the Tribulations of Israel. Fascinating work by one Samuel Usque, a refugee from Portugal, who wrote a, a brilliant kind of trialogue, uh, a sort of a play, in which several biblical figures discuss the history of the Jewish experience in rhyme, and uh, it takes us all the way up to the 16th century and, and folds the experience of the Inquisition and the exile within the larger arc of Jewish history. A fascinating work of Jewish thought and scholarship and also history, although presented in a rather unusual way. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic moment that illustrates what the impact of the Sephardic exiles in um, 
the Iber the Italian Peninsula is the so-called Ancona affair. Ancona is a, uh, a significant port on the Adriatic Sea. You can see it on this map. The if you look at the Italian boot, and uh, I pronounce that like a Canadian, I know. And you look sort of at the back of the calf, you see there's the, the port of Ancona, and just to the north, another port of Pesaro. Ancona was a deeper water port and a little bit more attractive to many Portuguese Jews who made settlement there. And they were free in Ancona. Even though it was a Catholic country, they basically, you know, uh, they had a fairly... Uh, light supervision from Pope Paul III, and these Portuguese Jews essentially went back to their Jewish identity, even though they were technically Christians because they have been forcibly baptized. Things changed dramatically under his successor, Paul IV, who was really quite upset that even in the Italian peninsula itself, so close to Rome, there would be Jews who would return to their Jewish identity, or rather, I should say, conversos, forcibly converted to Christianity, returning to their Jewish identity, that he ordered them arrested by the Inquisition and tried for Judaizing, and ultimately he burned 25 Jews at the stake in the 1500s. Now this was such a, a reactionary kind of dramatic and uh, you know draconian imposition of Catholic doctrine, but it was you know not so surprising for Paul IV. He also wrote very early on in his career something called Cum Nimis Absurdum, which was a papal bull that essentially said it is so absurd, that's what the title really means, the beginning of this bull, this document that it was an encyclical sent out to uh, Catholic churches, it is so ridiculous that the Jews should be allowed to essentially ply their religion within Christian territories, especially those Jews who have already become baptized, uh, forcibly or otherwise. And so he had a very negative approach to the Jews. He imposed the ghetto in Rome. Uh, he attacked the Talmud and so on. And of course, in Ancona, he killed 25 of these baptized Jews for returning to their ancestral faith. This provoked a dramatic reaction from two very powerful women. And I would like to suggest here that it is not inconsequential that we're speaking about powerful women in the context of the Sephardic diaspora. Let us recall that when the Jews were exiled from the Iberian Peninsula, this was like a huge inversion of everything. All of the traditional power structures were gone. All of the traditional authority figures were scattered. And it took some very strong individuals to assume leadership. Two of those very strong leaders happened to be women. One of them was Doña Gracia Mendes Nasi. Um, the term Nasi is, is, means literally the prince, the leader. And it was a family name, but it was also applied to her as, a, as an honorific. She was a brilliant woman who actually came from the... Uh, the Portuguese extraction, meaning she did come from a forcibly converted background. And she, of course, was incensed that the Pope would impose this on the Jews of Ancona and actually kill 25 Jews in this matter. And so she, in a rather unusual move for a woman, used her significant wealth. She was a very important uh, supporter, for example, of the, the Bible we, translation we saw earlier and also the uh, consolations by Usque, she called for an international Jewish boycott of the port of Ancona. And she did this from Constantinople, where she had made her home. And this was like earth shattering that Jews should, for the very first time since they lost their homeland 1500 years earlier, she was saying they should internationally organize to exert their collective pressure on the church to abandon these anti-Semitic policies. Amazing, audacious, outstanding. And, and, and by the way, this is a very dramatic portrait of her that we don't exactly know what she looks like. This is a modern portrait. I like to think she does look something like this. We do have a portrait that is made from a medallion that does not represent Doña Gracia herself, but rather her niece who had the same name. So 
perhaps it does look a little bit like her. Unfortunately for this movement, which did gather significant steam within the Ottoman Empire, she was opposed by another very powerful woman named Benvenida Abravanel from the famous Abravanel family that fled Spain. And the fact that uh, Doña Gracia was from the Portuguese extraction and Benvenida Abravanel was from the Sephardic, the Spanish extraction is not inconsequential. This is also not a picture actually of Benvenida Abravanel. It is a, for, uh, a portrait, a very brilliant, you know, glowing portrait, I think, of her student, Eleonora of Toledo, a non Jewish woman. But uh, I think it's still worthwhile including it here, not only because it's so beautiful, but also because uh, Benvenida was chosen chosen because of her superior social skills and ethic, etiquette to be the tutor to the young Eleonora of Toledo. It was believed that this Jewish woman knew more about how to behave in polite society than any Christian tutor, so she was so chosen. Um, at any rate, Benvenida, also a very wealthy woman, also very well-connected and very much supportive of Jewish scholarship and so on, she disagreed with Doña Gracia. Two female titans disagreeing on a moment of great consequence for, for Jewish European history. She said that if the Jews were to boycott Ancona, then all the Jews living in it, uh, Catholic countries, in particular in the Papal States, where she was at the time, they would suffer an anti-Semitic backlash. And furthermore, the port that would have been possibly an alternative to Ancona in northern uh, Italy in Pissarro, it was not nearly as good a port as Ancona. And the duke in charge of the region, the Duke of Urbino, also had a pretty nasty anti-Semitic history himself. So Benvenida respectfully but forcefully disagreed with Doña Gracia on her idea of a boycott. And unfortunately, it uh, just uh, ran out of steam as a result of this conflict. So we see that even though it didn't succeed, nevertheless, all of a sudden, Jewish women are able to exert uh, power on an international level, totally unprecedented and completely related to the disruptive nature of the Sephardic diaspora. Again, there's a lot more to say about Europe. I would love to talk more about Holland and Amsterdam in particular, but I'm going to save that for a little later. Let us just conclude this lecture with a very brief look at the Americas. Some Jews felt that the best way to escape the clutches of the Inquisition was to adopt a very traditionalist approach and run very, very far away. The furthest away they could run was the newly discovered territories in the Americas. And although ultimately many of the Jew these Jews would settle in America itself, or the United States of America itself, uh, you can see here this uh, beautiful piece of sheet music that uh, captures a little bit of the way in which Jews regarded the United States. It was literally called in Yiddish, the Golden Medina, the Golden Land, because of its welcoming nature. Um, the, the famous poem, uh, the, the New Colossus, that, that uh, graces the Statue of Liberty, was, of course, written by a Sephardic Jew, Emma Lazarus. But uh, much of this early settlement, which was dominated, by the way, by Portuguese Jews who were technically Christians and were allowed to make these kinds of journeys without as much difficulty, uh, was settled primarily in the Caribbean and in South America initially, especially because uh, the uh, Portuguese had significant holdings in Brazil, for example. Jews were very active in many of the new industries that were developing, such as sugar, very heavily connected with the sugarcane industry and the processing industry and bringing it back to Europe. Uh, there's also some involvement, unfortunately, of Jews with the slave trade. Not in any way disproportionate to their numbers in terms of their, their small trickle of immigration to the New World, but nevertheless, uh, it is you know part of the overall trade, and Jews were involved in it just as much as Christians were. So these communities would grow significantly, particularly when we get to the end of the 19th century in the United States of America, but that's going to have to wait for later videos. Uh, for now, we've got a, a little bit of a sense of the scope of the Sephardic diaspora. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you will continue with us as we go on to discuss it in greater detail. Thank you for watching.